experience to stand before such a great congregation. I thank God for all you became, even for uh, those that didn't. Like you were saying earlier, a bishop who really needed to deserve the vacation, he earned that. And he earned every moment that he was there. And I, I just thank God for his strength and his diligence. And I thank God for giving me a word. <laughs> I felt a little bit like uh, Rachel. Uh, I had I got two words inside of me. Feel pregnant. I got pregnant with two words, and I'm wrestling with which one to preach. And I'm, I mean, even to the day, I didn't know which one to preach. But on December 26, 27, I was supposed to came here and preach a word. But on December 26, I got attacked by a stroke demon. This demon had me, and I could I could barely walk. It had me. Hospital. My blood pressure had elevated, and, and I had a point where I even couldn't barely lift this right leg. They had a rope around me, and they walking me down the hall. And I thank God that about two or three days later, it's like it came to life. There's no paralysis. There's no even evidence that he even had a stroke. God is good all the time. And I thank God for everybody in this year. Thank God for up to you to sing a song of your praise to tell you how I adore you and Lord I lift my voice up to you I'm going to just try it another time because what we're practicing is kind of right but it's a beautiful song huh key you in. Go to e, uh, C sharp major. Yeah. Okay, play C sharp chord. Go to, go to uh, A, A sharp major. Now go to B flat minor. Huh? Go.
Hallelujah. Lord God, I just ask you, Lord God, to use these lips of clay. Lord, there's none like you, Lord God. Lord God, you could have used anybody, Lord God, but you chose to use me. Lord, you called me from my mother's womb, Lord God. And it took these many years, Lord God, to prepare me. Lord God, what your fault it was mine. And Lord, I thank you, Lord God. And Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart, Lord God, be acceptable in thy sight, Lord God. Use me on today, Lord. Bless our pastor where he is, Lord God. Give him rest, Lord God. Give him a double portion, Lord God, of your spirit, Lord God. And all that went, Lord God. We thank you for your mercy, your love, and your grace. And we'd be able, we'd be glad to give you the praise, honor, and the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise the Lord. In the Old Testament, we learn about omnipotent God. And he went about and he used people in a mighty way. He called, he parted the Red Sea. He caused the great wall of Jericho to come tumbling down. He followed the children of Israel, a cloud by day and, by, and a fire by night. And we also learned about omniscient one, the one of Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ was omniscient. Omniscient means all-knowing. Omnipotent means all-powerful. And God dealt with the, the children of Israel through his power in the Old Testament. And then when Jesus came on the scene, he was the omniscient one. He knew everything. Even when uh, uh, the lady came to the well, he knew her whole story. He, before it was time for him to go, he told him to go, told his disciples to go get an ass that was tied up in the crossroad. He knew that even in Matthew chapter 24, he goes on to tell about what's going to happen when he's returned. He's omniscient. He's all-knowing. And these two attributes of God, but who I'm going to talk about today is the person of the Holy Ghost, which is omnipresence. He's the omnipresent one. A lot of people, they really don't understand the, the office of the Holy Ghost. But I'm here to tell you today, Jesus, when he went, he, when he came, he said, he said, I'm not going to talk about myself. I'm going to talk about my father. And Jesus went on and on and on to talk about his father. And he told, and he told his disciples and he told everybody, he said, now, when the Holy Ghost come, he's going to talk about me. That's why you hear so much about Jesus, because it's the office of the Holy Ghost. Now, I want you to turn in your Bibles, amen, thank you, Jesus, uh, to uh, Matthew chapter 4 and uh, 1 and 2. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. And as you go there, uh, you can stand for the reading of the word. When you got to say amen. And it says, then was Jesus led up into to the spirit of the wilderness to be what? Tempted of the devil. When Jesus came to this world, he had an assignment to do. And the first thing he had to do is be confronted by the adversary that confronted Adam. And in that test, Jesus passed it. And, but before that happened, something happened. Jesus was baptized in the Jordan by a man by the name of John the Baptist. And the Bible says that the Holy Ghost descended of him upon him like a dove. And he was what? He was driven into the wilderness to be what? Tested by the devil. And that was the, that's the first time you really heard about, when well, you heard about people being filled with the Holy Ghost, but not like Jesus. Jesus was filled with the Holy Ghost without measure. In Acts chapter 13 and 2 and 3, uh, one of the attributes of the Holy Ghost, the Holy Ghost is a person. And the, and the Holy Ghost spoke right here, and it says, As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereof I have called them. What it's, what it's saying is the Holy Ghost has a voice. The vo Holy Ghost is the third party in the, in, in the Trinity of God. A lot of people don't believe in the triunity of God. You may be seated. Amen. But God is a triune being. God came in the presence of Jesus, in the person of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ came in the flesh. And he came in the flesh to, tra to train us. And as he trained his disciples, his disciples, they, they really didn't understand who he was. 
they was with Jesus. I mean, Jesus was had, had them by the They were catching fish. The only thing that he just taught us how to catch fish. He fed 5,000. But Peter asked, he said, who do men say the Son of God is? He said, some say that you're Elijah. Some say that you're Jeremiah. Some say that you're one of the prophets. He said, who do you say that I am? He said, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. He was the only one really that had revelation who Jesus really was. The rest of them really didn't know. I mean, it was to a point when he called, when he called Peter, Peter really didn't know who he was then. But the way he got Peter's attention, Peter was a fisherman. Peter knew everything what he could know about fish. And what had happened is when Jesus, he, after they had came back and they had washed their nets, and I mean, they had toiled all night and nothing had happened. And so when Jesus had to, Jesus knew he was going to call Peter, but Peter was a hard man. Peter had a hard character. So Jesus had to figure out a way. He didn't have to figure out a way. Jesus is omniscient. He know all things anyhow. So what had happened is that when he, he told Peter, he said, Peter, he said, I'll lodge, lodge out into the deep. And Peter said, wait a minute, uh, you, G, wait a minute, Jesus. You don't know who you're talking to. I am the fisherman. I know everything there is about fishing. You know, and, and we done toiled all that night, but he said, but at your word. People thought that way, hey, uh, Peter did what Jesus said, but Peter didn't. Peter took and just pulled out a little bit and threw his net into the water, just trying to please Jesus. And, and what happened? See, what happened? Jesus said, throw your nets. Peter threw his net into the water. And what happened? And after fish just came everywhere, he didn't have to convince Peter no more. That was it. He had, he had Peter's attention. Peter was ready to go. He had Peter. And, Pe and after he had caught, after he had saved Peter, it was easy to save the rest of them. It's just like some of the people we know. It's some people that we know. You say, Lord, if you would save him, wow. Just like Saul of Tarsus. Saul was a hard man. Saul went around and persecuted and had Christians killed. And people, I mean, even to the point when God spoke to Ananias, Ananias had an argument with God. He said, God, do you, know who, do you know who that is? He said, I know who he is. He said, but there's many things that he must suffer for my name's sake. But people, sometimes God don't call normal people. Sometimes it's like you got to go through a little bit in order for God to use you. A lot of times you got to be a testimony. I tell a lot of folks, I say, you know, when I, before God, when God started dealing with me, you know, the Jehovah's Witnesses started coming around. And, uh, the, and, and I tried it. I tried to uh, study with them, but I just couldn't get home fast enough from partying and getting high with my buddies. So what they had, they, <laughs> it, it, could, it, it wasn't strong enough. And they, I needed something stronger. I needed some Holy Ghost, fire chasing, demon delivering Holy Ghost. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Not only for me, but the people that was around me. I mean, the influence that I had of people around me, they, I mean, if, you know, I, I wouldn't even be out of church good. They'd be sitting out in the parking lot waiting on me to get out to get high. Come on. And it was to a point where, hey, man, I, I, I knew that this is, and I liked it. I played in a secular band, and, and we would go around, we would get high, and we'd play all night and get high. And you know the life with people that have bands, it's, it's real worldly. And, and, and I had a lot of friends, I had, a, you know, and I had associates, but it, was, but, it, but it took the power of God. I experimented on a lot of different drugs, too. You know, and I didn't like, uh, I didn't like the heroin and the, uh, uh, and, and, and the, and, and the uh, cocaine and stuff because it was downer. I was crazy. I liked it, the speeding type stuff. I was the type of person that would like those mind-twisted drugs like LSD and THC and mescaline, where, well, you know what I'm talking about, sister, that will put you on the trip for, for, I mean, some of them guys downtown right now walking around with bell bottoms and an afro still in the 60s because they done mess with some mind-twisting drug. That's the type of drug that I was fooling around with. But by the mercies of God, he saved me and delivered me from that crazy stuff. And when I got saved, my brother said, hey, he just tripping. He done, he done, he done went, his mind is still fried from what them drugs had did. Because I had a vision. I saw Jesus. 
And my brothers, and I called everybody in my family, and I began to tell them, I, I, I had a vision. I saw Jesus. And, and I didn't know what was going on. And so he would start telling my family members, no, he, what happened, he, have, he just having an episode from those drugs that he was taking when he was younger. But, it, but I got saved, and, I, and, and, and what happened, I got filled with the Holy Ghost. Then I began to realize what the vision was. Because over it's what does it say in Acts chapter 2, verse 20? He said, But in the last day, said God, He said, I'm going to pour my spirit upon all flesh. Your young men should have visions, and your old men should dream dreams. And that's what happened to me. I had a vision. I had an open eyed vision. I saw Jesus. And what had happened is my life began to change from that moment on. And I was going to traditional Baptist church. But it was to a point where that's all I could do. And I needed some more power. I mean, I, I, this, but I had gotten a little bit better. I mean, I wasn't getting high every day. I could, I could at least hold on to it. The Baptist had me holding on to it at least to the weekend. They had that amount of power. <laughs> they had that amount of power. I, I, you know, and, and they, they helped that. But I messed around and ran into Bishop Tate. <laughs> Woo! And what happened, and that's what happened when Pastor Tate prayed for me in 1977 and I got filled with the Holy Ghost, the, oh, Jesus, Lord have mercy. My, my, the, the devil had to sit my brother here from Louisiana on the assignment to stop what was happening to me. And what had happened is that uh, when we went to Pastor Tate's house, and he prayed for me and prayed for him. He spoke in tongues, and I didn't. And I didn't think I had it. And then one day, uh, we were going to, we were all one of the same time. I was one of the, Pastor Tate was an evangelist back then. And uh, we were going to Greater Faith. Pastor Charles Middleton, he was the, he was the residing pastor. And, and, as, and, and we went to church, and as we were coming home, I saw these Jehovah's Witness talking to this lady on the porch across the street from me. And it was in the summertime back in the 70s. Back in, it had to have been 77, 76, 70. Anyway, it was in the summertime, and it was hot. So we came home, and I got out my clothes, and we tried everything we could to keep cool. So we laid in the living room, put under the fan, and the air was blowing in on us. And, and the Holy Ghost just kept messing with me. So I said, and I went back in the back room and said, Holy Ghost, what do you want? <laughs> and he spoke and said, I want you to go over and pray for that lady. Get her out of the wheelchair. And I, I shook my head and I went right back into the living room with my family. And the Holy Ghost started messing with me again. And I'm just, I'm just getting the Holy Ghost. I really don't know no Bible. And so I, I got back up and I went. In the, so I just grabbed my Bible and I went down the street where she was. And the Jehovah's Witness had left. And so as I walked up, she said, here you go with your Bible. She said, you come to tell me some more stuff about the Bible. I said, no, I come to get you out of that wheelchair. She's, and, and I said that without even knowing. It just came out of my mouth. And so as, as uh, I walked up on the porch, I began to quote Acts chapter 2, verse 20. It said, God said in the last days, he's going to pour his spirit upon all flesh. And, said, and, your young men have, and I didn't even know what was in the Bible. I started quoting in, uh, Jerem, uh, Jer, uh, Acts chapter 2, verse 20. And I found that it's also in Joel. And as I went over to her, my hand, I touched her head, and my hand just stuck to her head. Now, granted, this is in the middle of the summertime. Everybody outside watching. This woman weighed, it was a big woman. She was in a wheelchair. And as soon as I laid hand on that woman, jumped up out of that wheelchair, started screaming and hollering and jumping around. And that woman got healed. And the neighborhood saw it. Then it was no more down in my mind that I had the Holy Ghost. And I found out that the reason what was holding it up was I'm, I'm analytical. I, I, you got things, if things don't make sense to me, I, I'm not going to accept it. I'm not going to accept anything. It's got to make some kind of sense. And I'm trying to reason how the Holy Ghost works. But it, it, you know, the Holy Ghost is something that you got to take by faith. And faith is a substance of things unseen. That means the faith is invisible. Faith is a substance of things hopeful and evidence of things not seen. So therefore, you, know, you got to have, and I begin, God began to work on me in my faith. And I begin to uh, grow in the Holy Ghost. But the Holy Ghost has come to us today. And it says over in John uh, chapter 14 and 16, and Jesus said, And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, and he, and he may abide with you forever. 
chapter of John 14 and 17, even the spirit of the truth whom the world cannot receive because it seeth him not. Neither does he know him, but you shall know him for he shall dwell with you and he shall be in you. So the Holy Ghost, which is the hope of glory, and that's our ticket that's out of here. See, when Jesus comes back, the Bible speaks about those that are sealed. Sealed for what? For his redemption. See, in other words, if, if, you, ain't, if, if you haven't been filled with the Holy Ghost, I mean, I, I hope that salvation is enough to have, make, give you exit out of here. But when Jesus comes back, come on, when Jesus comes back and cracks the sky, I mean, I had a dream one time that Jesus came back. And when Jesus came back, I did like this. <laughs> I didn't go up. And that's the way it's going to be. The Bible speaks about laying aside every weight. The Bible said, what we're supposed to wear this what? Wear this, we're supposed to wear this world like a loose garment. In other words, anything in this world, that, that, that it's, you're supposed to be able to let it go. Anything. You're supposed to be able to let it go. We can't allow things to steal our joy. And there's certain things that cause me to have a stroke that's called stressors. Different things that, 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 that cause you to worry, it's a stressor. It would cause you to be hyperactive, you know, and you have, uh, uh, what do you call, what do you call that, Nisi? People have hyper, hypertension. Hypertension is because you're worrying about stuff all the time. Something that never, that not, is not even going to happen. I'm talking to somebody out here. You're worrying about st stuff that haven't even happened. And, and, and most of the time, the way you play it in your mind, that when the time comes, it don't even happen like that. And you be worrying for nothing. That which is not of faith is sin. And we begin to be worrying and worrying and worrying. We can't, that Bible says what? Be careful for nothing. But of all things, we pray and supplication. Let your requests be known unto God, for he cares for you. And what they're saying is, God wants you to worry about nothing and pray about everything. God is a good God. He didn't leave, he didn't leave, he, he didn't leave no stones unturned. In the, in the next, <laughs> in the next sermon I was, it was, it was thinking about is uh, Jesus on crack. Y'all say, uh, what? Jesus on crack? Jesus was on crack. So how can Jesus be on crack? So we, he experienced everything we experienced. So he must have experienced crack. Not in his body, but in somebody else's saved body. Because what happened, the Bible said, when, the Holy, when you get the Holy Ghost, Jesus is in you. And some people that's done been saved, then went back on crack. Jesus on crack. I remember Bishop Pate, remember when he came here, he gave us testimony. He said he was shooting up heroin and working miracles. Y'all remember that? Remember Bishop, Bishop Pate when he came? He said he was on heroin, shooting up heroin, and God was still using him. Didn't he say it? I remember that. Just, but Jesus can do anything. But I'm not talking about uh, living any kind of life. But God can use you if you surrender yourself to him. God is, is looking for people right now. He's looking, he's, and I was speaking on the radio and I was speaking about, black men, it's our turn. What are you talking about? You know, it, it, it's no coincidence that we have a black president and people think that because uh, uh, we have a, a black president, is, that's something that's historical. No, I was telling, uh, even when uh, we were speaking, how when Jesus was carrying the cross, Simon helped him. And everything in the Bible is metaphoric. It's, it's a shadow of things that's going to happen. And I do believe from the bottom of my heart, it's our time. It's our time to carry the gospel of black men. And God put a black president in there. Whether he isn't carrying the gospel or not, that's on him. I mean, he has a choice. I got pictures. We got pictures that I'll praise the Lord. My wife's sitting there. God bless you, baby. Amen. She came. We've got pictures of the clergy laying hands on him don't we? The clergy laying hands on him. He could have easily been, he could have easily stepped on the scene and began to exalt Jesus Christ. No, but what he began to do is to, you know, he trying to give the gays the rights. And then he's, then he's going out of his way for people that's Islamic. I mean, that, that, I said, well, Lord, but God, that's why we got to pray for our president. We got to pray for him. 
Because what? There's absolutely nothing too high for God. God can get in him. God can turn him around. I don't care what people say. I don't, I don't believe he's the Antichrist. I believe it's just our time and tag, he's it. But in, in all the spirits of the world has jumped on him. And sometimes it's hard. It's hard being saved. It's hard being saved and a black man. Because they, you know, it, it, it's, you know, because a lot of the things that, it's some, th it's some restraints that has been placed, it's some demonic spirits that has been placed on us because there's a call on most of our lives and, and, it's, and, it's, and it's holding us back for a thing. But he said, but the people who know that God should do what? They should do exploits. And that's what it's time, it's time for us to get, to get right with God, Harold. It's time for us uh, to get right with God, Andre. It's time for us to get right with God, young men. You know, we have a men's meeting, and, and, and Harold asked a question. He said, well, I can see you, you older guys got it. But he said, but how come uh, uh, it, it really haven't, they don't get it to a point. I said, well, Harold, it's a lot of things that was imparted to us by our fathers. My father knew how to do, I mean, he was an uneducated man, but he could do masonry. He could do electrical work. He could do carpentry, and he never went to school up for it. But he just did it. And, and that gift was handed down. One day we was up here working, and I was explaining to them, it was Pastor Finch, it was, it was uh, uh, myself, it was Howard, it was uh, John, the other John, uh, the, white, the, the white brother. Uh, it was Howard. Everybody was here was 60 years old. And we up in here working like we were young men, only by the grace of God. And I, that's really what amazed me was our pastor. When the pastor came, I mean, when I, when I, worked, when I looked into this, when, I, when we walked in here, and I think that's what really, when I walked into this building and I looked at it, I got tired. <laughs> it's going to take a whole lot of work to get this building in shape. And Pastor Tate, I mean, he looked at it as a challenge. He put his nose to the grind, and he went at it until the heat was on. Because when we came in here, it was hot. We had fans blowing in here cooling the place off, but he kept saying it's going to be a winner, and I think he said it too much, because hey we got a winner, we got a winner that's, 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 that's out of the record, it's, it's, oh, we go, I'm going I'm to make them pay for getting in that building, they, uh -huh, they ain't pay for $50,000 I'm going to make them pay $50,000 worth of heat, but the devil is a liar, because we done survived the winner, it's March the winner's be behind us now hey, amen, we're going on to a glorious and a warm summer and we're going to get out, and we're going to reach the losses in this neighborhood. And we're going to use the young people. Young people, let me tell you something. The world wants you. You really don't understand. the. Pre and I understand there's a lot of pressure on you. Because we didn't have 100 and, well, we didn't, we didn't have 500 channels <laughs> to look at on TV. And, 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 and that television impresses a lot of young people. And they feel like, I'm not, you know, I, it's a part of me that's not fulfilled if I don't have cable TV or cell phone or, uh, or, or on the Internet or, or on Facebook and all. And a lot of them, you know, they, they got so much to compete with. We didn't have nothing but, I mean, we played in the alley. We, didn't, we looked at TV for a little while, but we stayed outside most of the time. We didn't have no video games. It's a lot of things that distract you young people. But you got to be sold out for Jesus. You know, and, 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 and I got to say, God is going to use you. God is going to use you because, see, y'all smarter than what we was. It's some intellect that y'all got that we haven't, you know, we just don't have. But, you know, but with that intellect, there's great responsibility. It's great responsibility for you. You know, you're smart, you know, but you can't be too smart. You can't be too smart and, to know that there is a God. There's a, hell to, there's a heaven to gain and a hell to shine. You got to know that God loves you very much. And regardless of what your friends promised you or, 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 or what, you know, what you think that you want, you got to put God first. You got to put God first in your life. It says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all of these things will be added unto you. You know, it's like, hey, God know what you need. God know what you want. God want to give it to you bad and you want it. He said, but they don't seem like they like seem like everything, everything going away from me. God, but you're not seeking the God hard enough. You gotta seek God like you seek to live. And Pastor told me like this: the way you seek God like you uh, seek Him to live, if just say, just say, uh, 
Pastor Mike was baptizing you, and, and Pastor Mike took you down in the water and held you down longer than the air you had in your lungs, you're going to be fighting to get back up <laughs> but the fun of that water. That's how you got to seek God. You got to seek God like you seek to live. Because God is good. And God is worthy to be praised. I thank God on today. I thank God on today because God has changed my life. Like I said, like, and, and I like what David said. Once I was young and once I was young. <laughs> he said, now I've got no. And never have I seen the righteous forsaken or they see it out begging bread. Hey, remember the days when we would go, that we'd be walking down the street and, 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 and look, and he, come here, young man. And them old people would come and try to tell you about Jesus, and we thought they was tripping. But it was something about them old sweet people. Looked like they never needed for nothing. And everything they touched like it turned to gold. And they died a good old life. And it was something always, it was something always different from them. And the other folks that drank and partied. You know, they end up either in prison or, or, or dying from overdoses. And them the people we admired. We admired the prompts and the prostitutes. I mean, it was something about their lifestyle that just intrigued us. Stayed up on 12th Street going, there was a place called Reggie's where they gave the, the guys the processes and, and flamingos. And, you know, and the women would walk down the street and they looked, I mean, they were dressed and they, and they were in their attire. And you, I mean, it was, it was phenomenal the way, huh? See, in the Chit Chat Lounge, in the Club 12, you know, it was, in the 20 Grand. It was something about that lifestyle that was just intrigued you. You had to get into it, you know. But when God came along, God came along and changed us. We were one of them. We loved the party. It was like, hey, but God's love is stronger than that. But I'm here to appeal to you. You know, I'm here to appeal to you. You know, we got to seek God a little bit closer. I mean, I, I, I was telling my daughter, I said, you know, you got to get as close to God as you can. And like I was telling uh, her, a, a single woman, a single woman, Nisi, a single woman do the things of the Lord how he may do please the Lord. So sometimes these single people, they can see it somehow, it seems like they can get a little bit closer to the Lord than we can married folk. But, said, but the married man do the things of the world how he may please his wife. You know, it's like, I can't be right. <laughs> I got to let my wife be right even though I am, you know, and, and a lot of times, you know, us married po folks, you know, we, we got to keep giving a, you know, we've got to understand that, you know, uh, all the time when we going through stuff, it ain't always us. It ain't always, sometimes the devil gets in between a relationship. He gets in between, it's happened, I was married for 30 years before I married my wife. And what had happened, God showed me this demon would get in between me and my ex-wife. And he would stand, and I would look at her, and this demon would be standing right in front of her. And then she would look at me, and the demon would be standing right in front of me. Uh, in front of me. And it wasn't her I was looking at. I was looking at a spirit. And what happened was, you know, and, and the Bible speaks about how you, you don't wrestle against flesh and blood. And the devil was beginning to mess with marriages at that time. He was destroying marriages. I mean, you know, it was like you heard the story about with Pastor Larry and, and his wife his ex-wife and uh, Pastor Joan and my ex-wife, my wife, we all been married before. We went through that struggle. We got attacked in our relationships. It was hard. But I thank God. He that keeping his mind on me, what? He said, I'll keep him in perfect peace. I'll keep him in perfect peace. And I just thank God on night because we serve a God that has benefits. What does it say in one, what is Psalms 103? Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and do what not, but and forget not what all his benefits that what heal us all, that forgiveth our sins and what heal of all our diseases. We got a God that will heal you, not only fill you. And I just thank God on today. I'm not gonna keep you long because <clears throat> I, I notice my voice is kind of leaving. But I just want everybody to stand up for a moment.